Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to Model Building Tips. In this episode, I'm going to talk about doing a base coat for weathering on freight cars. I'm using HO scale cars as examples, but these techniques could be adapted to many other scales as well. Before doing any weathering, I like to make sure that any mechanical or detail work on the car is complete. That means that I've already adjusted the coupler height, checked the wheel gauge, fixed any wobble issues, and in general taken care of all the stuff I check for during my product reviews. Having done this stuff first makes it less likely that I'll mess up the weathering while handling the car to work on it. If any details are to be added, like hoses or uncoupling levers, that should be done at this point as well, unless there's a reason to leave something off until later. The weathering will help to blend any aftermarket parts with the originals. From time to time in the hobby press, you may see articles about how to weather a freight car, how to weather a locomotive, etc. Often these are presented as a step-by-step -step method, and while that can sometimes be useful, it can also lead to doing things the same way over and over. This can actually decrease realism rather than adding to it. I would advocate for always using photos as a reference when weathering and trying to reproduce the effects you see rather than relying on formulas. Especially with freight cars, since there are so many of them, it can be difficult to find photos of particular cars. You can usually find photos of similar cars, though. Look for cars that are similar in both design and color. One other suggestion I'd make is to base the weathering on the color of the paint on the car. What looks good on a dark-colored car may be overpowering on a light-colored car. I'd also advocate for weathering in multiple sessions and letting a car sit for a while in between. You can always add more, but it can be difficult or impossible to remove overdone weathering. To me, anyway, cars look better with a little less weathering than too much. Having said that, I find that I tend to start the weathering process the same way for most models. So I guess you could say I have a formula for the beginning part. That's what I'm going to focus on in this program. The idea is to do all the generic parts that are common to most cars without doing anything that would make it hard to do more specific weathering later, like trying to reproduce the effects you see in a photo. The steps in this process are coating the model with a clear flat spray, painting the wheels, and adding weathering powder to the wheels. I'm going to do a few cars so I have some different examples. I also like to work in batches of four to five cars at a time, but you could apply these techniques to individual cars as well. As I said at the beginning, my examples are HO scale, but these techniques will work in any scale. I like to spray the entire model with a clear matte spray finish. I used to use Tester's Dull Coat, and I still have some of that, but I'm not sure what the status of that product is these days. To me, a clear flat also works really well. You can use paint from the hardware store, but be careful and test it on something first. Model paint is made to go on in relatively thin coats. Some hardware store paint goes on very thick and dries with an orange peel finish. I ruined a model once trying to use a hardware store clear flat spray. A matte finish is microscopically rough, which is why it scatters light instead of reflecting it. That roughness also provides a good grip for paints, powders, and other weathering products. A clear overcoat will also help to even out any differences between the sheen of the paint on the car and the lettering. Sometimes the lettering tends to be a little shinier than the rest of the paint. Before painting, I like to make sure that the model is free of dust. A soft paintbrush makes a good duster. Compressed air in a can also works. If you're spraying on a colder rainy day like I am now, a hairdryer can help speed the drying process. My plywood surface isn't as clean as I'd like it to be and the spray was kicking up some dust. I put a layer of shop towels under the models to keep them cleaner. As a precaution, I wouldn't recommend putting the hairdryer too close to the model. If they get too hot, the heat can deform some of the small plastic details. I coat the underside as well. I'm not concerned about coating the wheels. I'll clean those later. As with any kind of spray painting, several light coats make for a better finish than trying to put the paint on too thick. I usually do two to three coats of clear to get the effect that I'm after. If you have to perch a car precariously to spray the underside, be careful not to let it blow over. I'd hate to have to fix this one again. Since the coil steel car has a removable hood, I'll paint the parts separately. Now that the models are clear coated, I've brought them back to the workbench and put them on their sides. I used a paint bottle to prop up the flat car since it won't stay in that position on its own. I'm going to use some Model Master Railroad Tie Brown because I have a bottle handy. I think this paint is now discontinued, but any medium brown color would do. I like to use a brush to paint the wheels on the car because that way I don't have to take the trucks apart. The trick is to spin the wheel and just hold the brush in one place to spread the paint. I paint the wheel faces and the backs of the wheels that are facing up as well as part of the axle.
When I get the first car done on one side, I rotate the models and put that one in the back. I don't worry too much about getting paint on the wheel treads. I'm careful not to get any in the axle bearing area though, as that could interfere with the car's ability to roll. One of the reasons I like to work on several cars at a time is that by the time I've done them all on one side, the paint on the first car is dry and I can flip it over and do the other side. I keep doing this and rotating them through until I get all the wheel faces painted. After the wheel faces are dry, I turn the cars upside down and check the axles. If they need more paint, I touch them up, again spinning the wheels as I go. When the paint is dry, I use a brass wire brush attachment in my motor tool to polish the wheel treads. I keep it on a low speed and use a finger as a brake to keep the wheels from spinning too fast. It's kind of a rare thing, but it is possible to heat up the wheel bearings by spinning the wheels too fast and melt them. I also make sure to hold the tool at an angle so that the bristles are rotating from the inside of the car to the outside. That way I won't scrape the paint off the wheel faces. This technique also works in end scale. I just use a smaller brush. Another thing I do sometimes is to take a slightly different color and use it to dry brush the wheel rims. In this case I'm using some Vallejo Dark Earth on the flat car. Since this color is slightly lighter than the main wheel color, it has the effect of putting a subtle highlight on the rims. I like to weather in layers. Most railroad equipment doesn't get dirty all at once and it doesn't get dirty all in the same place. Now that the wheels are painted, I'm going to apply some Bragdon weathering powders for an additional layer of color. These have an adhesive so they will stick. For wheels, I like either the dark brown for a general dirty look or a dark reddish brown for more of a rusty look. Varying the color of the powder can change the look of the wheel even if the base color is the same. I try to avoid using the orange rust color as it's very strong. Most of the real railroad wheels that I've seen tend to be some shade of brown. I put some shop towels on my work surface since the powder can make a mess. I like to use a micro brush as it holds the powder well. Like I did with the paint brush, I apply the powder and then spin the wheel to spread it around. I don't usually do the backs of the wheels with powder, though you could if you wanted to. Excess powder can be shaken off. Since the powder doesn't need to dry, there's no need to wait before doing the other side of the car. Just for some variety, I'll switch to the reddish-brown powder on the tank car. The reddish-brown color also works well on the couplers. And that's it. Even without any additional weathering, these cars look much more realistic now. With the flat finish and weathered wheels, these models are now ready to be taken to the next level. So that's about it. The cars are now at a good jumping off point for doing additional weathering. Even if you don't do any more weathering on the cars, I think they look way better than the cars do coming straight out of the box. If you like this video, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned and thanks for watching.